Good afternoon all. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the GeoDiv's third online lecture for the year. Today's online lecture is part two or the follow on from Dr. Vermeulen's site investigation lecture that was held two weeks ago on the 16th of July. Before we start, just a few points to note. All the previous lectures, that is Gavin Byrne's lecture on piling fundamentals and Dr. Nico's part one of site investigation are available to view on the Geotechnical Division's website under the events section. There is also a YouTube channel where the videos are. I have posted both of these links in the announcement section, which is to the right of your screen. With regards to CPD points, there is 0.1 CPD points that are given for attending these online lectures. However, EXA has asked us how we verify attendances. We understand that many of you, when joining the event, join so anonymously, and we're happy to leave it that way. What we would ask, though, is um, in the Q&A section, we would like you to post your full name and surname. Essentially, this would form part of the attendance register for us. When you post your full name and surname, only myself and uh, the committee members are able to view it. So no one else can view it, so privacy is guaranteed. That will form the official attendance register. So I would ask if you can please post your names now, rather at the beginning of the lecture, so that at the end of the lecture, we can focus on questions and answers. Okay, just like the previous online lecture, we will leave the Q&A open. Dr. Fumilin will try to attend to questions if and when he can. Alternatively, we will just wait until the end to get to the Q&A. For today, we've set aside 90 minutes for this session. Just uh, some interesting statistics. We had 238 RSVPs for Dr. Nico's first lecture. Today, we have had 290 RSVPs. So that's a 22% increase and that's really impressive. Well, with that being said, and I think based on the success of the previous lecture and today's turnout, Dr. Nico clearly needs no introduction. So on that note, Nico, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Brett, and good afternoon, uh, everyone from my side. Um, as Brett said, today is basically part two of what was meant to be a one part lecture, but time flies. And so we've decided rather than to rush through the presentations is to break it up or split it up into two parts. In fact, the whole topic um, is made up of three parts. And I know this is a uh, beginning to look a lot like uh, Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a trilogy in five parts, but nevertheless, in part one, we focused more on the, the work that we do in the office uh, as part of planning and designing the investigations, doing the desk study part of it. And we also dug a little bit into the legal side of the work that we do. Today is the more fun part. This is where we actually get to go out to site and apply our trade in practice. So I hope today that I can deal with the topics of test splitting, which I believe is our bread and butter, and uh, also look a little bit at uh, the details of sampling. Today, I might not get through all the slides as, as previously, but towards the end, uh, we are moving a little bit away from, from test bidding and sampling into the world of drilling uh, and so on. So that, that, that's not a train smash, and the slides will be available. And they naturally lead into what is the third part of, of, of the whole thing. Again, I've tried as I go through the slides to use icons to indicate um, topics that I think are hot tips or rules of thumb if you want. Uh, with the reading material that should definitely make part of your reference library. Some secrets or best kept secrets, Easter eggs, bowls of wisdom, uh, some, something for you to think about. And then last of all, those uh, Pandora boxes or cans of worms that I will recognize but not dare to open. Um, you will see as we go through the, the lecture today, I am very strongly opinionated about these topics. And I feel very strongly about certain aspects and that will certainly come through. The idea is not to be prescriptive in any way, but to rather give you some food for thought and for you to take from this lecture 
what is valuable and useful. Right, first of all, we're going to look at test pitting. Um, and really, that topic says it all. If you haven't tasted it, you don't know it. And we'll look at the purpose of test pitting, uh, some upgrades to your toolbox, perhaps, and uh, a few tips for, for test pitting from my experience in, in doing this for a good many years. And today's lecture, I want to start and end off with a quote from Trzaki. And this, this quote comes from 1957 when he passed on the presidency to Skempton after holding that position for, for 21 years. And Tuzaki said there, to acquire competence in the field of earthwork engineering, and you can read you technical engineering in there, one must live with the soil. One must love it and observe its performance, not only in the laboratory, but also in the field, to become familiar with those of its manifold properties that are not disclosed by boring records. And I mean, we can almost close off the lecture today at this point because it says it all is you cannot practice geotechnical engineering or engineering geology without experiencing the material that you work with. Uh, I, I can list examples of, of attending to sites where things have gone maybe slightly wrong. And many times the problem arises when designs are being made without the design engineer having been on site or experiencing the material in a test bed, having that look and feel and experience of the whole the whole whole thing it is essential in my view not only that the engineer that executes the design should and must be on site during the test pitting phase the drilling phase and the institute testing phase maybe not full time but at least experience those conditions real time and firsthand i also firmly believe that our engineers should spend time in the laboratories how can you interpret the test result if you don't even understand the difficulties around that testing procedure? If you don't understand the pitfalls and the short shortcuts, uh, it's it, in my view essential that the young engineers get opportunities and time to spend in the laboratories to actually, if possible, even do the tests themselves. I was fortunate during my, my, my time at University of Pretoria to, to have the opportunity to do many, many of these tests myself. And I can promise you, once you've done a proper sieve analysis, you will appreciate that result far more. All right, enough, enough of the preaching. All right, the purpose of test pitting. I think first and foremost, it is to get a profile description of the soil or the ground profile. And that we do according to the MCCSSO method, which everybody should be familiar with. And I've given you the reference on the slide as well. Then secondly, and, 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 the, and the next sort of five points or bullets actually make up what I consider to be the essential notes to each and every test bit once you've completed the profile description. And that is to classify the excavatability, and that's usually to do with the refusal conditions in a test bit, to assess the stability of the sidewalls of, of, the, of the test bit, which leads to an assessment of the stability of slopes that may eventually be excavated on, on the site. And that we do through observation of what happens to those slopes during the test pitting exercise. We assess seepage and the possibility of encountering a water table at the depth that we're exploring again through observations. And we have the opportunity to take samples for laboratory testing. And here it's important that we make sure that we have a good representation of the material on the site. Now, you know, if you're on site, you also have to keep in mind what is going to happen and what and, and, and how the the development of the site is going to take place. In some cases, it might be useful and necessary to surface uh, to sample the, the 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 topsoil layer, for example. In most cases, the topsoil gets stripped and stockpiled for landscaping purposes, and there's no use in doing that. So apply your mind to the sampling exercise, which we'll come to later on. And then also from from an engineering perspective, I think while you have the opportunity to be on site in that test but looking at the profile it is also useful to consider uh, what uh, where and how to place foundations in this profile in other words assess the bearing capacity of the different layers at the different depths uh, and certainly to identify any potential problem soils that that you may encounter on this site and then something that i'm glad to see is is is, is becoming more routine than it used to be, and that is to take decent good photographs of the test pit sidewall as well as the uh, the heap of excavated spoils on the side of the test pit. Um, I'm finding those kind of photographic records to be invaluable 
uh, when you later on have to use the information and just want to have a look again at, at what it looked like or um, where that layer terminated, etc. So I encourage everyone to, as, as a matter of routine, uh, and it's so easy these days with uh, smartphones in your pocket, is just to take a decent photograph of the side wall and of the, the spills heap. The two essential references obviously here are Jenning, Brink, Jennings, Brink and Williams that describe the MCCSSO method. And I think it's also imperative that um, you have a look through our safety guideline, uh, the safety of persons working in small diameter shafts and test pits for engineering purposes published by SISIM. Right, let's look at, at some of some examples of test pits. What types of test pits can you encounter during your, your work in the field? Now, working sometimes in the remote parts of Africa, it's not always uh, possible to get a machine to assist with the excavations. And then we have to rely on, on, on hand labor to actually dig the test pits. And this is a, it's a labor sometime consuming operation, but sometimes that is the only way to have a look at the, the profile conditions. Our standard workhorse is the TLB um, and also tracked excavators. The, these are our uh, bread and butter machines uh, used to excavate a, a test pit. One bucket with two refusal or reach limit of the machine uh, in order to enter this test pit for profiling, sampling and the rest of it. When working on the dolomites, uh, a single test pit uh, in, at, at, a, at a location is often insufficient to describe the highly variable profile that you encounter in the dolomites. So certainly in, 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 in my experience, our standard practice here is to open up a long trench. And this allows you, as, as the photograph shows there, to actually expose the pinnacle and great topography of the dolomite and to be able to assess the variability and uh, have a much better interpretation of excavation, uh, excavatability of the material, where to place foundations, the kind of problems you can encounter, etc. So certainly on the dolomites, trenching is definitely the way to go. Auger trilols used to be, um, you know, also a staple for geotechnical engineers. I think, um, well, at least in my experience, uh, they're not as uh, popular these days, but certainly still being done. And in a deeply weathered profile, this is certainly the way to go. The second advantage, obviously, of the auger trial holes is the additional information that you gain for the purposes of piling. Uh, drilling that auger trial hole gives you a lot of information in terms of the depth of drilling, refusal conditions, um, as well as levels of water seepage and so on. And I hope uh, in the photographs that I'm showing today that also what is coming out clearly here is um, our attention to, to safety aspects, uh, which is absolutely critically important while doing test bidding. And then maybe something we don't always appreciate is, is large excavations on site uh, in road cuttings, um, pipe trenches, etc. Those always provide a wonderful opportunity to see a larger part of the profile as opposed to a single test bit. Uh, the example here shows a dolomite profile where we can clearly see the draping of the material uh, over the, the pinnacled uh, dolomite rockets. All right, this slide used to be titled uh, you, that you cannot call yourself a man until you own all of these tools. And that's until my dear friend Heather pointed out to me that she actually owns more of these tools than I do. So the title has now changed to every geotechnical practitioner should own. And after Heather's comment, I also had to include the sixth tool there in my toolbox, and that is hairspray. So a sledgehammer, a double-handed axe, chainsaw, large diameter angle grinder, bolt cutter, and a can of hairspray. Now you'd be forgiven to think that um, this slide is completely out of place in a lecture like this, but I hope that by the end of today's lecture, uh, I will illustrate to you the usefulness of all of these tools, not only for DIY at home, but also as part of your practicing geotechnical engineering. And that brings me to your test pitting toolbox. Now I've uh, sort of tried to group uh, bits of kit that I think should be part of your toolbox into four different tiers. Uh, tier one is what I consider to be standard in your site uh, box 
And that should always be in the back of your boot or the back of your bucky and should accompany you everywhere where you go. In there, you should find your geological pick, a 30 meter measuring tape, a water bottle, some sampling bags, your smartphone, and as I will shortly show, there are good and evil associated with this device, and then a set of pencils. Now the pencils are there because pens don't work on a site if there's moisture or rain or seepage, etc. If you write your profile in pen on your notebook and that notebook gets wet, left in the rain, splashed on, etc., that pen ink is likely to run and you will lose the profile. So this is something that Peter Day has um, instilled in me, and that is when you go out to site for profiling, you take your notebook and a set of pencils. Now, they don't have to be HPs like I showed there. A clutch pencil is perfectly fine. Um, the water bottle thing. All right, so I also learned the trade with Dr. Fritz Wagner, and he taught me the spit and spat method. So you take your piece of clay out of the side wall of the test pit, and you spit on it until you can work it to feel the consistency, the, uh, the size of the particles in there, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem I have with that is by the end of the day, uh, I've dehydrated to such an extent that it at least have to have four beers to rehydrate again. And I'm sure in the current world of COVID-19, spitting and spatting on site is not going to go down well. So I've learned to replace that with a squeeze bottle of water and it works a lot better. The next tier of equipment that uh, we take with us is the uh, trusty old DCP. Uh, you can have a color chart if you are sort of color bright like, like myself. It helps to identify colors, but I want to come back to the whole color issue just now. A hand lens is certainly helpful. GPS device if your smartphone is not enabled or just in, in, in addition, and a set of gum boots for those wet weather conditions. Now, the color chart is useful to give us an indication of, of the color of the soil but I have a real problem with soil descriptions that go along the lines of slightly moist, which is fine, and then it starts. Slightly mauve, off-white, pale, khaki, speckled, dark, gray, streaked, yellowish, brownish, orange, and it carries on for seven lines before we actually get to the consistency of the soil. Think about the purpose of the description of the color of the soil. 90% of the time, that color description provides a clue for you to link horizons throughout the site. Layers uh, of similar color in different test bits will start to form a link across site, and you can start to find um, the, the, the depth and depth variation of certain layers. It's certainly not worth spending 90% of your time in the test bit log logging the color and 10% Log, logging the rest of the MCCO characteristics. Right, next year is tier three, where we start to do testing in the test pit. And uh, there we can use a hand vane, which is used to uh, measure the undrained shear strength and residual shear strength of clay materials. A very, very useful uh, piece of kit. It uh, comes in a small carry on bag, uh, hard plastic carry. And uh, very simple to just push this into the sidewall of the test bit, slowly rotate it until you find the peak strength and then keep on rotating until you can measure the residual strength right there. And then in the in the field on site, a perfectly good measurement under appropriate conditions of the undrained shear strength of clay soils. I've also seen uh, uh, pocket penetrometers used uh, to determine the stiffness of soils. Um, personally, I prefer the old pick by hammering the sidewall of, these, of the, uh, the test pit, and once your arm is properly calibrated, that should be good enough. But um, certainly, if you can spend the time and understand and calibrate the pocket penetrometer, that might also be a useful tool in order to um, determine stiffness and consistency. A laser range finder is proving to be quite a useful piece of tool. Uh, it helps you to measure distances on site between uh, features like walls and corners of buildings, etc. cetera. Um, but I will also show later on how useful this can be um, for other purposes. Then if safety uh, allows a bottle of diluted hydrochloric acid and peroxide uh, can also be taken to site, this will assist in the identification of carbonaceous materials 
and uh, dolomitic watt, for example. Uh, by pouring a drop or two of this, uh, these solutions onto the material, effervescence will indicate whether carbonates are present. And that would, for, for example, assist you in, in, in differentiating between a calcrete and a silcrete, where the, one will, where the calcrete will fizz with the hydrochloric acid and the silcrete will not. And then lastly, uh, we move on to tier four, and this goes almost into the realm of on-site testing. And, and this is, uh, in my mind, the lightweight deflectometer, which I'll tell you a bit more about later on, and then the standard plate load testing equipment. So that sort of breaks down all the kit that we can take to site in four different tiers, of which tier one is essential, tier two is very useful, tier three it, and tier four, et cetera, builds up the whole package. All right, coming back to the cell phone. I don't want to say much more than this slide. It says here, my rule on site is when you are test pitting, you are not on your phone. No texting, taking calls, messaging, etc. I have no problem with taking a break during tea time, lunchtime, etc., and catching up on your emails, your texts and messages. But while you're in the process of test pitting, the only thing that you use your phone for is taking pictures and for taking GPS coordinates if necessary. Um, you know, I, I, not to hammer on the point, but um, many years ago, we lost a dear friend, Kali uh, Stradom, in a test pit uh, under circumstances similar to, 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 to what is shown here. Um, it was a very terrible, tragic event. Um, Kali took a phone call inside the test pit and was uh, unfortunately covered up by the TLB op operator whilst in the test pit. Uh, so please, in, uh, if you're on site with me, the rule is your cell phone is used for photos and GPS coordinates, no texting, messaging, etc. unless you take a break. All right, a little bit more preaching. As for divers, who use a buddy system, I believe the buddy system is also applicable for test pitters. In fact, in uh, Jones of Wagner, our geotechnical department, the slogan is geotechnical engineering, engineering geology, with the emphasis that of the synergy between the two sciences, between the two disciplines, between geotechnical engineering on the one side and engineering geology on the other side, meeting in the middle, holding hands on site and bringing both sciences to bear on the problem of describing the profile and understanding its genesis, its properties, and its engineering behavior. Not only is there a benefit in, mar in the marriage of these two sciences, but also in terms of safety. Uh, whilst one person is in the test pit profiling and sampling, the other is in attendance at surface, looking out for clues of instability, signs of danger, etc., and uh, can provide the person inside with early warning to get out or in the very unfortunate event of an accident occurring, that second person will have the knowledge, the skill and experience to know what the safe and best way to extricate a person from a collapsed despot is. If you want to put your, your hands, uh, sorry, if you want to put your life in the hands of someone else, then I want that someone else to be someone that I can trust, that I know is the right training and the knowledge in order to give me the best chance of survival in case of an accident. And I know the practical problems with this, and I understand that many young people are sent out to site alone because the budget does not allow two technical persons, uh, cannot, cannot be afforded. In my mind, that is complete taboo. All right, just a picture of um, the, the standard safety box, uh, sorry, test pitting box, also showing some safety equipment. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with this. Uh, some extra bits and pieces. There's the hand vein shear test, Pilkin in this case, top left, uh, a ladder for safe access and egress, uh, the DCP penetrometer, and a shovel, which if not available, your hard hat makes for a nice uh, replacement. All right, this slide uh, shows something that certainly in my, in my I don't want to say old age, but even after many years of experience, one of our young engineering geologists uh, Rian Huster showed me this neat little trick. Now, the hand lens, is, uh, lens obviously is wonderful for getting a close-up view of rock minerals and rock types and soil samples. And in this case, what Rian did is, if, if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, uh, it's not as apparent that this uh, soil, sandy soil, 
as a collapsible fabric. But once you start viewing it through the hand lens, um, you can clearly see the voided nature of the, the structure of the soil. And uh, by simply marrying your, your hand lens with your cell phone, you're able to take really good pictures like the one on the right hand side. I think this is a really neat trick and I, I will certainly keep this as, a, as a one for the future. All right, last time around, we, we had the opportunity to do, to do some interactive uh, question and answers. And one of the questions that I asked you is, um, what is the one thing that when you arrive on site, ready to test it, uh, when you look in the back of your car or pocket, you realize, ah, that's the one thing I did, I forgot. Um, and your answers was compiled into a pictograph like this uh, from 68 votes. This is the outcome now. Obviously, they are, you know, so, Sunscreen can be sunblock and um, come uh, sun cream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it almost looks like sun sunscreen is coming out as the clear winner in this situation, and certainly that is something that is important to have in your box. Uh, what worries me a little bit is that even uh, just as prominent is the geological pick, and I guess in cases like that, the standard old 12 millimeter rebar will have to substitute. Uh, a few of the ones that I've marked there, um, I, th I actually added to my, my list of um, equipment in your toolbox being gumboots. Uh, well, well, that's an interesting one. Uh, a chalkboard to mark up the test bit number for photographic purposes. So I think that's a, that's a nice to have. And then the one that I really like is the assistant. So it's kind of strange if you rock up on site and you realize that you left your assistant at home or at the office. Right, in my experience, what do we tend to forget? Okay, uh, certainly also sunscreen um, or a hat. Uh, today we have these uh, wide brim inserts or exits that fit onto a hard hat that provides good protection against the sun. Um, if you're gonna spend many years test pitting, being up, out in the open sun, yeah, it is really important that you protect your skin and uh, sunscreen certainly is, is a very, very important part of your kit. Something that I also discovered is called Stingos. Now, unfortunately, it's no longer available in South Africa, but I'm sure there they are, they are different brands or makes. And this is magic stuff. If you get stung by a bee or an insect, bitten by something, uh, one or two squirts of the Stingos will certainly deal with that very efficiently. Um, if you have allergies, uh, get hay fever during those periods uh, of the year when, uh, when there's pollen and seeds and stuff in the air, Make sure that you take your uh, antihistamine with you. Pack a lunchbox and take lots of drinking water. And Red Bull certainly does not qualify as drinks on site. Conditions will also dictate what you need to take with. Uh, if it's going to be extremely dusty or if you're working on a landfill site, anything like that, a proper dust mask or respirator is essential. Uh, in noisy environments inside working factories, uh, on sites, etc., proper uh, uh, hearing protection is essential. And in today's world of COVID-19, uh, your face mask obviously has to go. Uh, something that I often forget is uh, good protective clothing, either a, a warm jacket or a waterproof jacket or an umbrella for rainy, snowy, cold, hot weather, no, not hot, but cold, rainy and snowy weather like, like shown on the picture there. Yeah, I guess uh, gone are the days where every tree is a lavatory and every test pit a latrine pit, um, no longer allowed on site. So I think it is important that we consider not only uh, ourselves, but those who accompany us on site and make adequate provision to visit toilet facilities, um, arrange that with a client up front where, where you can have access to facilities like this. Uh, just keep it in mind and be considerate to those that work with you. All right, I thought I'd uh, just add this slide. Uh, the pictures speak for themselves. You now, going out to site, you will encounter many interesting situations. Access to and on the site can be a bit of a problem. It's always good to be aware of these, these issues and to plan ahead and make provision. And you can see there bottom right where my angle grinder and bolt cutter comes in handy. Now, jokes aside, um, 
people, it's it's really important that when when we're out on site that we respect the property of other persons. Uh, you know, cutting down wire fences, breaking open gates, locks, etc., is not on. These things need to be arranged with the client before we go to site. Uh, where you are going to access private property, farms, etc., is always a good idea to meet up with the owners, with the farmers up front, and to explain to them what we are doing and to get their permission to access their land. Now, again, I know it's difficult. Uh, we're always under time pressure. Only so much time budgeted for those 20 test bits, uh, but that's no excuse to not uh, respect other people's uh, property. Uh, something to consider, for example, and, and certainly this has come up in our company, is 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 driving in in the felt, in open grassland. You know, these uh, four four wheel drive buckies of ours. There's prop shafts underneath this vehicle, and we have had uh, an, on occasion that we uh, the the grass, the the tall grass, actually wraps itself around the prop shaft and eventually winds so tight that it physically breaks the universal joint be between the, the prop shaft and the differential or the gearbox. So, you know, just common sense um, needs to be applied when you're on site. Uh, grass seeds into the radiator. If you drive long enough in the, in the, in the, in the, in the grassland, you might um, plug up the radiator and the car can overheat. So just bear in mind some practical considerations when working or driving to site and actually working on site. While we're on site, we encounter many different animals and critters. And again, um, be considerate, if possible, rescue animals, take them out of harm's way, uh, be watchful where you drive, uh, test bit, etc. One of my most scary encounters on site was not the snake, but uh, digging open a, a bee's nest that was for some other reason made in the ground. Uh, I cannot explain to you how we ran around on that site until all four of us got inside the cab of the excavator. Certainly not a pleasant experience and, uh, you know, can very, very quickly turn into a, a emergency situation if someone is allergic to bee stings. So again, keep eyes open, watch what you're doing, be considerate. All right, working uh, uh, on, on farms especially, our first rule of test pitting is that you do not leave site until you have either properly barricaded the test pit or backfilled it with the machine. And I can promise you, if you leave a test pit open on a cattle farm, those cows will come and investigate this thing that you made in the ground here. They are extremely inquisitive animals, and I can promise you that it will be the farmer's most expensive um, animal that ends up in that test bit with a broken leg and you know what the end of that is going to be. So not only in terms of safety, uh, but for many good reasons, we do not leave site until we have made safe the excavations. And I know it gets challenging, it, you know, it gets late and dark and you're pushing for that last one or two test bits. Um, it's very important that you do not leave the site until you have made the area safe. Whoa, sorry about that. Here we go. All right, moving away from the excavation of test pits, while we're on site, we also have the opportunity to carry out some uh, rudimentary basic screening testing. And it, certainly the mechanical dynamic cone penetrometer or DCP requires no introduction. It's a workhorse of our trade and it's used and abused to great extent. However, Technology moves on and there has been an evolution of tools that we have access to and that we can use on site. Uh, the DCP has evolved into the lightweight deflectometer, which I'll tell you a bit more about just now. So we've gone from mechanical to electrical and from electrical, we have gone to miniaturization and smart technology. Uh, I can see in the, in, the, in the near future that the smartphone with uh, a various accompaniment of sensors will become part of the tools that we use in our everyday trade. Yeah, yeah. how many soldiers do you need to do a TCP? Uh, the reason for the slide actually is the, is the laser range finder. Now again, uh, one of our young engineering geologists has made me aware of this neat little trick is instead of using the ruler to take measurements of the penetration of the DCP, they are now using the laser range finder 
uh, and just it speeds up the whole process. It keeps a record of the um, the data, the measurements taken, and if you have a slightly upmarket version of of, a, of the rangefinder, it will actually link up with your smartphone, and you can download those readings real time, export them to Excel, and Bob's your auntie. You've got your results processed in no time. And this is just an example of how we need to embrace technology and use technology to our advantage. Not only does it save us time, but I'm pretty sure it improves the accuracy of the measurements as well. Another question I asked last time around was, uh, what have you used your DCP for? And the results of that is shown on the next picture. From 71 votes, we have uh, 34 applications for determining the in-situ CBR for quality control purposes in layer works. And as it should be, this is the, uh, the, the most or the application of the DCP that is most uh, applied, and, and that is what it should be used for. Uh, the next highest number there is uh, to determine bearing capacity for footings, and then to do subgrade classification, measure the stiffness of the soils, and unfortunately, even 17 occurrences of using a DCP for pile design. Now, actually, I don't have a huge problem with any of those one, two, three, four, five uh, applications of the DCP, but I have a problem where reliance is placed on this tool and its data to the extent that it excludes anything else. As a screening tool, the DCP is a wonderful piece of kit and I strongly recommend the use of it. But first of all, you need to understand its limitations. And second of all, where you move from a basic screening assessment to a design application, it is insufficient as the only data point that you have. So in my mind, the trusty old DCP is both a blessing and it's a curse. And I strongly advise that you read through uh, Phil Page Green's uh, uh, book or no, publication. I believe it is available online. Unfortunately, I didn't put a link up on the slide, but if you search for it, you'll find it. The use and interpretation of the dynamic cone penetrometer test. Central reading. And as I've listed in the previous slide, um, the uses of the DCP extend to determining the equivalent CBR. And what I've tried to do on this slide is to actually give you the references uh, for published information on this, these applications. So CBR from DCP, from client's publication, bearing capacity, stiffness, subgrade classification, and uh, really, no, not pile design. If you go for pile design, you can just as well predict what, which horse is going to win the Durban July. Now let, me, let me explain to you to some degree why I feel this way about the DCP. And, and this comes from having been called in on a number of projects where things have gone wrong and where heavy reliance is placed on DCP test results for everything from the original site investigation to the inspections once excavations were done to the quality control of the full being placed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what people often forget is that when you are doing that DCP, you are penetrating soil which is probably close to optimum moisture content if it has been placed in full. Certainly not saturated. So the penetration rates that you are going to measure in a relatively dry soil is going to be much lower. In other words, the soils are going to be stronger compared to what we typically in the laboratory refer to as a soaked CBR. Now, this works come from, from Phil's um, publication, and I want to illustrate to you the drastic impact that water and moisture will have on your CBR determined by DCP in comparison with what your design specification is referring to, which is the laboratory soaked CBR. So the blue column there, and I've just picked one of the columns, you can, you can read through the publication and get the, all the nitty gritty of it. The blue column there tells us what and uh, th these are CBR values, what CBR you will get from the DCP if you 
did the test at optimum moisture content. I think that the wet refers to 0.98 or 0.99 of optimum or something like that. So for all intents and purposes, it's a test done at optimum moisture content just after the layer has been compacted. If you drive your DCP through that layer, those are the numbers that you are likely to get in a G6, G7, G8, G9, G10 type of material. If you are going to base your design on those numbers, you're going to find yourself in hot water very, very quickly. Because if you look at the yellow column, those same materials under soaked saturated conditions will reduce in CBR to the values in that yellow column. There's an average of four times reduction or as much as seven times. So it, it gets worse as you go to the poorer quality materials. So it's actually a double whammy. You know? You know, the bad materials is even far more affected, affected by the moisture changes. So the purpose of this slide and my, and my ranting about the DCP is, yes, by all means, please use it, but understand its limitations. Understand that when you hit a gravel underground, the penetrometer will slow down. Those CBR values that you derive through work that was done, will come up with a CBR that is likely to go to be probably four times higher than the equivalent soaked CBR. So have all of these facts in your mind when you analyze your DCP results and when you base your design. Because remember, from here on, the next step is determining the bearing capacity of a footing, determining the stiffness, which leads to settlement. So if you start wrong, you're going to end up with incorrect bearing capacities and you're going to underestimate the settlements that occur. So the logical progression of a site investigation is to do your initial assessment with a DCP or to do quality control with it and then to evolve, to move on to, for example, a DPSH penetrometer where we have the ability to penetrate the soils much deeper and we have more better established correlations between the DPSH N value, the drive uh, rate, and for example, the SPT N value. And as you know, the SPT has a whole plethora of methods that from which you can uh, derive bearing capacity settlement and, and, and a great number of things. And if necessary, you evolve onto the next stage where soil conditions allow being a full piece of cone test or, or cone penetrometer test. And probably the, the last step of the evolution is something like this, where you have a fully truck mounted automated system to do cone penetration testing. But this is for, for another time. The lightweight deflectometer, LWD for short, is a piece of kit that we acquired at Jones and Wagner some time ago, and, it's, and I've, I've found it extremely useful. Essentially what it is, is a handheld plate load test. And it can do this by virtue of the fact that it uses dynamics. So it's, it, it's like a, a DCP penetrometer, but instead of a cone point, you have a, a plate, like a standard plate load test, a 300 millimeter diameter plate, and you have a drop weight. The whole thing is uh, fully instrumented and electronic. So by dropping the weight onto that plate, it, it creates a dynamic impact. From that impact, the plate will move at a certain velocity, which is measured by an accelerometer, similar to what's in your smartphone. And all of this data gets logged in real time and processed into a, an equivalent dynamic stiffness. And if you read the work of uh, Tampai, Tampai there for, for the publication listed at the bottom of this slide, he gives us a handy way to tra uh, transform the dynamic modulus into the equivalent plate load, static plate load, virgin modulus and static plate load rebound modulus. Now again, you can you can almost see here how we are stretching things. We are almost again at the design point where we can plug a parameter into a design equation and come up with a, a solution. Remember, these are screening tools. It's a first stab at parameters to guide us into the right direction. But it is it is extremely useful to be able to write there on site while and you can see there's a printout in this guy's hand. There's a printout that comes out of this thing. It locks the data onto a memory card and the more modern ones will actually send it wirelessly to your cell phone. So again, right there while you stand, uh, within five minutes, you can have the stiffness of the soil under that plate. Typically, um, they come in two sizes. Uh, you get a 10 kilogram hammer or a drop weight and a 15 uh, kilogram drop weight with a standard 300 millimeter plate size. Now, this is important because remember, 
this plate is nothing other than a typical or a prototype foundation. So you are not measuring the stiffness of the soil all the way to China. You will only measure the stiffness of the soil within the impact or influence zone below the plate, which is for argument's sake and for all intents and purposes, one and a half times the plate diameter. So for a 300 millimeter plate, you can measure effectively the stiffness of the soil to a depth of about half a meter below that plate, no more than that. The international uh, standard is, is provided there. And as I've said, uh, the more modern equipment, the ones that you can now buy off the shelf, is now fully uh, wireless and will connect to your smartphone uh, and, and makes it very easy to, to use in the field. The procedure is shown on this slide. So the first step is to bed the plate onto the soil. Always useful to have a bag of fine sand um, in, your, in your box so that you can spread a, layer of, a thin layer of sand over the soil. You wiggle the plate into position, assemble the drop weight, uh, connect everything to the logging station. You then do three or four or five test drops where the equipment will determine whether the seating of that plate is adequate to take a, 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 a good measurement. Once it's happy, you do three or four or five drops and it will log those and present you with a digital display, print out and electronic data stored on a flashcard. So really a useful piece of kit um, to have on site if you are interested in stiffness and settlement. And I've used this equipment at various levels in a test pit. By spending a bit of bit more time in the field, you can excavate benches in the, uh, the ground profile uh, so that you can expose the top of each representative layer and have the opportunity to do a measurement like this on site right there and then. And, and it's extremely helpful. Uh, you know, clients are pushing us all the time to get results out as quickly as possible. Can't wait for laboratory test. You must issue a report within two weeks of being on site. You can update it later when the laboratory results become available. And as you know, as, as much as I hate doing that, a tool like this gives you the ability to, have, to at least have a measurable parameter to use in that early uh, version of your reporting. The evolution of this equipment obviously is from the LWD to a full standard plate load test like uh, this arrangement set up here that we commonly use on site. And I must say the modern equipment for plate load testing has evolved um, quite a lot. It's no longer a bulky cumbersome piece of kit. Uh, the plates are aluminium. It's not heavy anymore. Uh, certainly something that you can carry around in the back of the bucky and with uh, with Kentlich on site, either by excavator or a loaded dump truck or something similar, it's uh, quite easy to do these tests. And then if you really want to evolve to the next stage, we look at something like this. Some years ago, Paul Main did the Jennings lecture for the geotechnical division, and something he mentioned there struck a chord with me. And I actually went back or went to the internet after Paul's lecture and I uh, I looked for the, 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 the equipment that he that he mentioned. And essentially, well, what it was is this is this piece of equipment called the Seistronic RS100. Unfortunately, the company that uh, manufactures this equipment has discontinued it and I have not found a replacement for it. So what is the Seistronic RS100? It is actually just a pocket size seismograph and it is the screening tool of what a full geophysical seismic reflection and or refraction survey will evolve into eventually. But for that first visit to site or while you're test pitting um, and in attendance on site, this piece of kit allows you to do a quick seismic refraction test uh, with just a sledgehammer and these two devices, the one being the trigger and the other being a geophone connected to a base station. So you uh, embed the geophone into the ground, put, uh, well, you can even use a heavy rock, I guess, or a steel plate that you can cart along, plug your hammer into the trigger device, and it's then just a matter of um, hammering onto that steel plate, creating the geophysical or the, the shock waves in the ground, which is picked up by the geophone, and the software that comes with this will allow you to quickly analyze and determine uh, parameters such as shear wave velocity and we know once your shear wave shear wave velocities uh, exceed about 200 meters per second that's a reflection of good ground conditions if they fall below say 100 meters per second then you're in trouble 
So right there on site, while you're doing your, your site walkover or test bidding phase, you can already get some useful information. Again, a very nice screening tool, which needs to evolve eventually into um, probably a CSW like this, which is done by Professor Eman at University of Pretoria, or if you're in America, um, the shaking truck, which is a very large scale um, CSW test or, or seismic refraction test. Uh, just back to this slide. Um, so this is the pocket seismograph. In fact, you can also now buy off the shelf a pocket CSW version. Now, if Professor Heyman is online, I'm going to ask him to cover his ears because this will be sacrilege to him. But um, what this company has done is they've actually just mini miniaturized the CSW test and packed everything into a cylinder, including the uh, the, the the energizer, the uh, the vibrating mass, as well as the sensor that records the ground vibration. So it's all packaged into that cylinder. You plonk it down on site, bed it in, switch it on, and it will do a mini CSW test for you right there and then. Again, coming back to the point, a very useful screening tool that needs to evolve into a proper CSW test or proper seismic refraction uh, and similar other tests. And I think lastly, in terms of useful kits, um, I just want to mention um, fancy GPSs, maybe for want of a better word. So, you know, your phone has got a, a standard GPS in it. You can buy a more dedicated um, handheld unit like the Garmin uh, field units. Uh, but what we've acquired at Jones of Wagner is one of these uh, Trimble single unit differential GPSs. Now, this is also evolution of technology. You know, in the old days, the surveyors used to have uh, two units on site, a base station unit and a, a roaming unit. So you would plonk down your base station. It gets geo referenced properly and it then provides a beacon that talks to the to the unit that you've got in your hand and walk around site doing your survey measurements. Um, that the purpose of the base unit is to send through the corrections due to the set, you know, the, the physics and geometry around the satellites and the scrambling of the signals and a whole host of things that I can't go into now, but it sends the necessary corrections to your roving unit so that you can do sub centimeter accuracy measurements. Today, we don't even need a dual unit system. Um, in South Africa, you can see the little map there shows the red beacons, and these are the national trick beacons that are transmitting corrections real time uh, within the area of, of reception. And you can now have a single unit, uh, and I think this is the latest one, the Geo 7X unit, a survey pole and a Zephyr antenna. Those three pieces of, of equipment will bring measurements down to um, on-site to an accuracy of three to three and a half millimeters horizontal and vertical. And that's astonishing. Um, it is actually incredible that with a simple device like this, you can get survey accuracy level recordings on-site using something like this. And we have used this, this equipment, um, the, oh, sorry, this slide just shows the whole technology. You can see the single unit there, there's a base station, both of them are receiving information from the satellites. The base station then sends the necessary corrections, either through a cell phone link or a radio link or something similar, and that gets processed in your hand unit. And by standing there logging for argument's sake, two minutes, you can do sub-centimeter accuracy surveys on site. The unit that we have is uh, slightly older than these modern ones. We still have to go back to the office, download the data, then download the base station corrections and do the, 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 the analysis in the office. The modern units, it's all on site via your cell phone link. And just as an example of the application of this technology, uh, the left hand side so shows a landfill site. One of our technicians went out with a trimble, spent different, yeah, I, I guess a few hours walking about 16 kilometers with the device taking spot readings, which you can see there. That's then processed into a topographical map, which results in a three dimensional model, which can be used to do, for example, uh, stability uh, calculations with up to date, accurate surveys of a ground profile. This slide I'm going to skip, but this is my um, my own attempt at using 
uh, a cell phone to take vibration measurements. The, the, well, I'm into it, so I can just as well carry on. At, uh, at one point, I was interested in damage caused by compaction equipment, especially uh, for roadworks and pipe laying in urban and, and suburban areas. Um, last time I explained the, the claim that the one landowner instituted against the contractor for damage to his house. Uh, the purpose of this experiment was to see whether you can, with a normal cell phone, uh, do vibration measurements using apps that you can download from the website and then process the data and uh, map out the frequency spectrum um, of, of the vibrations, which we can then compare to standard published guidelines and, and, and tolerances. Uh, and that would be a wonderful tool for a contractor to have at hand. You can just basically put his cell phone on the owner's uh, wall, run his compactor through, take the measurements and see, oh, this is going to be a problem or no, this is with intolerance, no, no hassles at all. Unfortunately, the cell phone by itself, um, after, after many hours of struggling with it, um, the sampling frequency of the phone is too slow. So in order to apply this technology, we'll need to have a plug-in sensor like the one shown on the right-hand side there. This is on the market. You can buy it. It's a vibration sensor. It interfaces with your phone, and you would then be able to carry out an exercise like that just using your phone. All right, just a last bit on, on the phone. Um, this slide shows a, a piece of kit called the Node, and it was, um, it, it, it was developed by engineers at NASA on request of the Department of Homeland Security, where they were interested in finding a ready, easy, accessible means of uh, measuring uh, or identifying uh, toxic gases. And this person at NASA uh, went to develop this node element. And what it is, is a base unit with a number of sensors that you can just screw into the ends of, of the base unit. It again talks wirelessly to your phone. Um, so the, the unit itself, as you can see on the left hand side, has got a gyroscope, accelerometer, magnetometer and storage capacity. But you can then plug in sensors that can do gas identification, chemical screening, radiation monitoring, temperature measurements, vibration measurements, color measurements, pressure, and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, strangely enough, I think the, the widest application of this technology is to do color matching in interior design. So what I want for Christmas is a node enabled geological pick. Imagine having the capacity to just hammer into that side wall and each after each blow on your cell phone, it'll come up with very soft, stiff, medium dense or something similar to that. Um, but uh, I mean, jokes aside, you could very easily use that thing to measure uh, moisture content, I, I assume, with the right technology and proper calibration. There's no reason why a device like that cannot just be pressed into the soil to give you a moisture content reading. All right, moving on to tips for test pits. Uh, my first gripe is going to be with those test pits, okay, maybe first introduction, MCCSO, Jennings, uh, Brink and Williams, um, in their wisdom, they've given us five classes of every category. And I've just for the sake of it, used the density one on the right hand side there. We've got very loose, loose, medium dense, dense, and very dense, five classes. 99% of profiles are profiled loose to medium dense, dense to very dense medium dense to dense. I say to you, stop being a wimp and pick a class. There are five classes, not five intermediate classes or 10 classes in total. So in that profile, you describe the consistency as either loose or medium dense, but not loose to medium dense. It's a different story. If the layer starts out loose at the top and progressively becomes medium dense towards the bottom, but that's then how you log it but not a wimpish in-between class for everything. No, moist to, slightly moist to moist, and then a long color description, loose to medium dense. And so it goes, I, I guess I've made my point. What um, Jennings et al. did not give us is a proper uh, dealing with pedogenic materials and with the description of gravel layers. So I've just basically, um, dotted down my personal take on, say, pedogenics, ferricrete, 
um, which I have five classes that I like to log them in. Um, first class being hard pan or rock like, then going to well cemented, possibly honeycomb, weakly cemented, which may be powdery in some cases, nodular or sparse nodular. These are the, the categories that I, or classes that I like to, to log um, uh, the pedo pedogenics with, but I refer you to the work of Frank Netterberg, who has uh, wrote, wrote, written many papers on the subject and is the authority on them. I just wanted to highlight the fact that this is something that we need to consider uh, when in the test, but that's not dealt with by the MCCSSO. And I think it's important that we understand the description of these types of materials uh, and the proper way of doing it. And I su suggest that we stick to five classes as per the rest of, of the method. And the next one, oh, sorry, and I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think um, from, from the uh, from SAIC side, they run uh, practical courses and people like Tony Abair have published work on this uh, where you can find all the nitty gritty and details about this. I just wanted to highlight it as part of this of the session. Gravel descriptions, again, if we're going to stick to five classes, and I'm aware that um, Tony describes them slightly differently, but the, in essence, they, they're the same thing. If the layer, such as the photograph on the right hand side, is class supported, in other words, there's more gravels and boulders and stones and bricks and what knows in the, in the profile, um, we can describe it either as closely packed or relatively closely packed. And as a rough guide, we say that it's closely packed when more than half of the, 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 the coarser particles are touching or relatively closely packed if less than half is touching. There's an error on the slide. Then we move on to the matrix supported uh, categories. That's where there's more fine material between the coarser particles. And there I like to use abundant, say for 25 to 50% scattered 10 to 25 percent and occasionally if you only see the boulders here and there in the test bit. Um, the wording is not that important but consistency is so if you consistently describe your gravel horizons in this manner it becomes easy to interpret and easy for other people to understand what you are describing. And and, and size does matter um, and I think it's it's a skill to be able to be in a test bit in the field and to be able to identify a fine sand from a silt or a, a coarse sand from a fine gravel. And I encourage the young engineers in our office to actually collect canned fruit bottles of samples of single graded material. And we've started a collection there um, in, in the office that contains material between two and six millimeters, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a good thing to every now and then dip your hands into these uh, uh, jars and to just feel what a, a medium sand feels like or feel what a coarse sand uh, feels like or look at it. And it's important that we develop the skill continuously uh, and calibrate it until we can describe these things accurately because it's, it's quite embarrassing when your profile locks something as a silty clay and the laboratory result, result comes out and it's actually a, a salty sand. What I've tried to do with this slide is sort of to link it to, to, to the, the food industry. So on the coarse side, the um, coarse gravels are like plums. And I think any, anybody can sort of appreciate that. The medium gravels are pea gravels or like peas in a pod. Fine gravel is uh, the size of a coarse salt, a rock salt. Coarse sand drops down into quinoa, medium sand sugar, fine sand salt, and then once we move into the silts and clays, you can no longer visually separate um, uh, these materials, and you have to play around with mazina, cornstarch, to understand how it behaves if you mold it in a, in a wet or moist state in your hand, how it dilates or not. Um, and then clay obviously has that soapy feeling. Now in the old days when we were still allowed to, while you're in that test, but if you take some of the clay and you rub it on your teeth and you grind it between your teeth, if there's no grinding, then that material is predominantly clay. But as soon as you start feel the, feeling grinding, but you can't feel it between your fingers, that's indicative of silt sized particles. Obviously be careful putting stuff in your mouth. Um, if there's, uh, contaminants or toxins in those soils, that's not a good idea. So no, not, not advised, but that's how we used to do it. I always say to, to the youngsters, you know, once you've done your test pitting and you're out of the test pit and you sort of clap your hands against each other once the material is dry, the stuff that 
shakes off and claps off. That is, those are the silt-sized particles. The stuff that remains like a crust on your on your skin that is hard and difficult to, to remove, those would be the clay particles. So continuously work towards calibrating your feel for these um, properties so that you can identify accurately the constituent particles uh, or size ranges within the material. All right, this, this slide is intended to show different kinds of behavior where water interacts with soils. Uh, the bottom right hand side there is typically walking on the beach uh, in a seed in a, in a sand, a medium sand that is waterlogged. You will know that as soon as you put your foot down and you shear the material, a dry patch develops around your foot. And that is due to the effect of dilation. Um, if you take cornstarch, and this apparently is a big thing in America, they fill swimming pools with cornstarch. And if you do it to the right proportions, you can actually physically run across the surface of that pool. Cornstarch uh, and, and some salts has this property that if you impact load it, it stiffens up uh, instantaneously. And by running fast across the surface of this pool filled with cornstarch, you can actually you, you can do it without sinking in. If you stop in the middle of the pool, um, that that instantaneous stiffening uh, dissipates and you will sink into into the pool. And, and the same with liquefaction. We know that contractive sands and silts, um, if you disturb them, um, they can liquefy and it won't support the, uh, your, your, you standing on that source. And if you understand these behaviors, you can understand the simple hand tests that we can do on site to understand whether we are working with a silty type material predominantly or with a clay type material. Uh, and these simple tests come from a wonderful little booklet called Stabilization of Soils issued um, by the PPC Lime um, Company uh, and advise you to, to have a look at it. Um, apart from the wonderful information on soil stabilization, it's got a few of these handy type tests, shaking tests and squeezing tests and worm rolling tests that you can do right there on site that will give you information um, as to what type of soil you are handling. Uh, something that uh, I always like to do is if you have this lump of clay in your hand that you've just dug out of the test pit and you're concerned about what's going to happen to this material once uh, it becomes waterlogged or saturated, uh, one of two things can happen. Either the soil will completely disintegrate and, and disappear as the suctions are destroyed or it will hold its shape due to permanent bonding between the particles. And a simple test is to chuck a lump of this material into a glass of tap water Leave it for 24 hours and observe what happens. So um, often, you know, just as a as a bit of a joke, and actually is is quite important uh, in the office. What we do is once we, when we are on site and we find some clay soils or other soils, we have a competition. So everybody's got to 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 uh, guess the grading properties uh, and the PI and the and the linear shrinkage of the soils, and each gets a little ball of soil in his hand and you write down your guesstimates and once the lab results come out uh, the winner gets a beer or something like that and by doing this continuously you're recalibrating your feel so and, and it's amazing I mean I've lost this this now because I don't do, do test bidding often enough anymore but it's incredibly how good you can get uh, when you keep on doing this and, and improving your, 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 your look and feel and taste of, of, of the soil. All right, I want to move on to sampling. So I'm going to skip through um, these slides. They are available and you can have a look at them. Um, I deal with problem soils. Um, maybe I'll just pause here for a moment. There are some publications that I think are essential reading. Uh, but I just, you know, you have to always think about two different types of problem soils when you're on site. Some of the problems derive from the soil properties themselves. Other problems derive from the setting within which those soils find themselves. And, and, and you should be able to recognize problems on both sides. So on the soil property sides, we have heaving clays, expansive soils, collapsible soils, soluble rocks like the dolomites, um, uncontrolled man-made ground like falls, organic soils, dispersive and erosive soils, the classical set of problem soils. And it's important that you can identify these in the field on site. On the right-hand side, we have uh, problems that derive from the setting, and these can be contaminated soils, undermined areas, steep slopes, uh, unstable slopes, seismic active areas, and areas prone to, to uh, pr prone to flooding. 
So it's always good to have these in the back of your mind while you're on site, observing the topography, observing the, the, the scenery or the, the surroundings, the soils themselves, etc., to be able to identify these early on, even before the tests are done. And in fact, to be able to specify the correct tests to be done on these soils. And then obviously the Bible of um, geotechnical engineering on site, uh, and, and, and in fact, engineering with those soils, are the four volumes of Brink, the Engineering Geology of South Africa. These are available from the Geotechnical Division. There's a link. You have to have these four volumes on your bookshelf. All right, I said one of the notes that we take and one of the important things that, that we do on site while in the test, but is to think about the foundations. Um, and what I mean by that is while you are, are looking at that profiling profile and you are digging in it and experiencing it and evaluating it, Always think about what is the purpose of what you are doing. And if it's to do with foundations, think about, and, and I like to use a standard 150 kPa pad footing with a settlement limit of one inch or 25 millimeters. Where in that profile can I place a pad footing or a strip footing that can bear 150 kPa of which the settlement will be limited to less than one inch? And it's again one of these skills that you develop um, over time uh, and, and, and begin to understand and lead you to an early evaluation of foundation solutions even before, as I said, you have your, your laboratory results available. And the laboratory results then um, serve to calibrate this, this skill that you're developing. And I just wanted to dwell on one quick thing here, and that's our rule of thumb that we say that, uh, and, it, and I mentioned it with the, the lightweight deflectometer plate, uh, for a pad footing, we usually say that the depth of influence of that foot, footing will be one and a half times the width of the footing. And that's a, got a, a huge impact because a footing that's five meters wide will have a seven and a half meter deep influence. A footing that's one meter wide will have a one and a half meter deep influence. In other words, the soil below one and a half meter doesn't really know that you've placed the foundation at surface. So the properties of the deeper soils are going to be less influential on the behavior of that foundation compared to the properties of the soil within the influence depth. So the rules of thumb is for um, pad footings, let's say circular and square for argument's sake, one and a half times as they become longer, it goes out to about two times the width. But, and this is what, what people don't always realize is once you start looking at strip footings, that ratio becomes four to six times the width of that strip. The influence step below a strip footing is not one and a half times its width. It's four to six times its width. And you can very easily uh, verify this with an Excel uh, spreadsheet where you can uh, program the Buzanay stress distributions, apply the loads, and something like this comes out of the wash. And what I want to show with this slide is our one and a half times and our two times derive from um, the attenuation of the load with depth. So you can see the blue arrow there, and this is for a strip footing. The blue arrow is at where the load has got to 15% of the applied load, and that's where the four times B comes from. Or if you go down to 10% of the applied load, it becomes six times the width of the foundation. You can see it, it goes on much deeper. But by the time you've, you, you only have about 10% of the total stress change under the footing, we can consider that as being negligible. So this is where all of those rules of thumb come from. I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that for round square footings, it's one and a half, rectangular two, strip footings uh, four to six. All right, I'm gonna take a breath and uh, a bit of water. All right, sampling. We don't have much time for sampling, so I'll, I'll quickly go through this and hopefully give you some useful information. Uh, I want to look at the purpose of sampling and then sample sizes and undisturbed sampling, which is uh, one of my favorite topics. This photograph of the moon is because I had the opportunity to work with uh, Professor Ernie Selig from UMass, um, who's a wonderful person, and um, he had the, the privilege of working for NASA in the early Apollo missions, uh, where they had to determine how big the pad, pads under the, uh, the, the lunar modules should be to uh, prevent that um, module from sinking into the surface of the moon. And they did wonderful experiments in vacuum chambers with all kinds of different materials, et cetera, et cetera. Very interesting read. I thought uh, I'd just share that with you. But in terms of sampling, we need to understand 
why soils behave the way they behave. And three things govern their behavior. The first is the composition. This includes the mineralogy of the particles, the particle sizes, the shapes of the particles, and the surface texture of the particles. These are intrinsic properties, and they lead to intrinsic parameters such as the um, angle of internal friction. The next thing that governs the behavior of the soil is its state of packing and bonding. The fabric and the cementation between the particles makes a huge difference to how that soil be, will behave eventually. And then the state, and that describes the uh, the stress state with which within which the soil finds itself, the history of the change of stress because soils have memory, the density state, and the pore pressure. And when you combine all three of these aspects, you can fully describe the behavior of a soil. So with this in mind, when you sample, and when you specify laboratory testing, or think about laboratory testing, you have to choose one of two routes. On the left hand side, you can take bulk samples, disturbed samples, a bag full of loose material that you take from the excavated spoils, for example. With those, you can determine the intrinsic properties of the material. For example, the friction angle and the grading uh, and the Atterberg limits and all those, those wonderful parameters. But if you want to engineer with those parameters, you need fancy models like the critical state models. So the behavior aspect of the soil is encapsulated in the mathematical model. That's going to decide whether the soil is going to dilate, contract, uh, strengthen, weaken, fail, yield, and all those things. You need fancy computer models, uh, analytical models, theoretical models to engineer with intrinsic parameters, parameters that are independent of fabric and state. Conversely, you can do the back of a napkin type calculations if you can determine parameters that, that encapsulate all those behavioral aspects. And this is where undisturbed sampling comes in. The purpose of taking an undisturbed sample is to retain the fabric and retain the bonding, and if possible, retain the stresses and pore pressures in the sample, and then test that sample at stresses that are going likely to be applied when, when, you, when you build your building, for example, when that footing is placed on it. The stress change you apply to that sample. So the sample has all the history and, uh, and the properties, and you test that sample and you get a parameter that's loaded, a loaded parameter like a Young's modulus. And then it's a very simple uh, matter of uh, plugging that parameter into a simple equation to, for example, calculate the settlement. So I think one, you know, when, when this thing clicked into place for me, it opened up a whole new world of, of geotechnical engineering, because if once you, once you can separate these two and understand how they work, you can apply them correctly. So the purpose of undisturbed sampling is to retain as much of everything that we see on this slide, which includes that we cannot mechanically disturb the sample. Um, we would like not to disturb the stress state. That's not always possible. We definitely don't want to change the density. We don't want to lose water or add water to the sample. We don't want to change the pore pressures. Now, it sounds impossible, but I promise you, a stiff London clay can be sampled in an undisturbed manner, virtually retaining all of what you see on the screen there. Uh, because it's such a low permeability material, it actually doesn't have time to change pore pressure and stress quick enough before you can actually get that thing into a triaxial cell and start the testing regime. Not perfect, but as close as you can get. Right, moving on to disturbed samples. Uh, so how much, how much is enough? How much sample should you take to be able to do your standard set of laboratory tests? So common practice, normal soils, we usually work with a, a rule of thumb that uh, for us, Standard foundation indicator, a small bag, about uh, half a kilogram is sufficient. Once you start doing compaction tests, uh, we typically take two large bags, like shown on the on the picture there. Uh, but if you want to do stabilization tests, then it becomes multiples of that, maybe up to 250 kilograms of soil specimens for all the tests at different cement ratios, etc. There are guidelines. The difficulty comes in when you have to sample and test, for example, rock. And for that, I refer to this paper by Galen Hoare, and 
they you start off with your uh, maximum particle size it can be a d90 or a d100 doesn't really matter let's say for argument's sake we've got a 100 millimeter size maximum particle we plug that into their chart and we read off that you need at least 150 kilograms of this material in order to do a proper grading analysis particle size distribution of this rock fill. and uh, this is one example there are others out there essentially they will give you the same so i hope that providing you with this uh, reference that if you get to the point where you have to sample these large particle size materials that you have some guidance as uh, to the quantity required and then lastly on to undisturbed sampling um, th this you know block sampling from a test pit or surface excavation is by far the best way to obtain an undisturbed sample and in that book by Chris Clayton that I gave you the reference of in part one uh, he's got a whole section devoted to the procedure for taking undisturbed samples. Um, essentially, what you need to do is to dig out a block of undisturbed soil uh, by various means, and then to protect that block as quickly as possible against moisture loss and mechanical disturbance. And that typically we do by covering it in multiple layers of cling film and uh, tin foil. Now, I've never uh, excavated block samples like the top photographs there. Usually what we find ourselves doing is something like the, the bottom right hand side uh, image, hammering out uh, a section or a block of soil from the side wall of a, of a test bed. And it's hard work and it takes a lot of time. And sometimes even when you extract that block, it breaks up in your hands. So it is it is something that you need to apply. You, know, you have to have, you take your time and do a proper job of that. Once that sample is um, isolated from its surroundings and extracted from the ground, it's important that we protect it. And often the, they are encased in boxes and you can even fill the space between the boxes with uh, bubble wrap or with um, this, these instant expander foams to make sure that it sits nice and tight inside that box and that it won't be sh uh, rattling around in the box when it's being transported to the laboratory. Uh, you can go to extreme measures of, of protection like this example here. Uh, I just wanted to share with you just two unique um, ways of, of doing block sampling. The first is uh, work that was done by um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Heathrow tunnels in, in London, where these are the stiff London clays, and the only practical means of taking block samples there was by using a chainsaw. And the benefit of the chainsaw is by uh, the teeth of this thing sitting, you know, protruding uh, wider than the chain itself. You're actually cutting a slot wider, uh, wide enough that you can uh, get rid of the cuttings during the cutting process. So you're not squeezing the sample and you're not getting the, 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 the blade jammed that causes disturbance. It actually is just able to, to cut into the soil and get rid of the cuttings and create a neat, tidy slot. And by doing this all, all around, you can then cut out a neat block that then gets protected uh, against moisture uh, loss and disturbance. Our own Peter Day, recent, well, recently 2018, did something similar in uh, some very stiff uh, structured clays near uh, Burgess Fort. And you can see the same principle being applied, cutting the material from the excavation, encasing it in a stable uh, box, and then just filling up and securing uh, all the void spaces. And then the whole thing gets covered up in uh, cling film and tin foil, which I'll show you now why, why we do that. An interesting one is the sampling of locked sands. Now, locked sands are sands that are aged, they are very old, and by virtue of their properties and the stress under which they sit, they eventually start to almost mold into each other, almost becoming like puzzle pieces, but without any glue. There's no cementation or bonding between the grains. And it becomes this very metastable type material that it holds its shape and its strength until you unravel one of the, uh, the, the, the puzzle pieces. As soon as you get rid of one of those pieces, the whole thing can start to collapse and unravel and just become a, 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 a heap of sand. So it's really one of the most difficult um, materials to sample in situ. Uh, but what Andy Creswell did uh, was he developed this uh, modified saw and, um, and a rope with uh, washers tied into knots. And with that, the same principle as the London clays and the, and the chainsaw is you can cut the material out, getting rid of the cuttings while you do that until you have your neat uh, little block sample. Um, but the magic then is that 
<laughs> you spray the outside of the sample with a nice thick layer of hairspray, which you can, if you're in the sun, it will dry very quickly, or you can just use a hairdryer to uh, set that hairspray. And what that does is it just creates enough of a uh, encasement, a skin around the locked sands that will prevent this unraveling of the sample. Once you've done that, you can further protect it, take it to the laboratory and extract your sample for testing. I thought that's quite a neat approach and, and a practical solution to something that is quite difficult to do. All right, sample care. Last uh, few minutes. Um, I keep on hammering about uh, protecting the samples against moisture loss and structural uh, or, or you know, da mechanical damage. And Professor Heyman, while he was uh, studying in the UK, did an experiment where he compared uh, various different ways of protecting samples, uh, including, as the slide shows, uh, unprotected. And you can see the, the moisture loss of the unprotected sample over 100 almost... Oof, looks like almost a year's worth of data that he collected. Um, uh, so that is, if we don't protect the sample, uh, you can see the massive change in the moisture content as the sample dries out, exposed to the atmosphere. But they need to different forms of protection, and you can see there cling film and wax, cling film only, wax only, cling film and foil. And you can see that by far the best result is obtained if we use uh, alternating and multiple wrappings of uh, cling film and tin foil. In, in fact, the tin foil is the is is the material that protects the sample against moisture loss uh, the most. Also, that cling film actually creates quite a nice stiff wrapping around uh, the sample. And I've I've been amazed when I've taken samples to the laboratory and they unwrap those to see that actually very frail samples. Just that protection from the cling uh, the, the tin foil uh, is capable of maintaining that sample in an undisturbed, undisturbed state until the lab manager can unwrap the whole thing and cut the test specimen uh, from that block. It's unbelievable and absolutely worthwhile doing. And then lastly, um, you know, some sample care uh, also extends to handling and transport. You can see on the left hand side there shall be tubes neatly packed and protected against shaking and vibration. Um, you know, it does not help to spend three hours on site cutting that block out, wrapping it, and then chucking it on the back of the bucky and, you know, driving at the speed of knots to, to the lab. You know, that sample goes onto the seat next to you with a safety belt on three pillows, and you drive slowly and carefully to the lab until you can offload the sample um, in the care of the, of the lab manager. All right, I'll just... Um, run through a final few uh, slides. Um, this is a sampler that I, that I developed for sampling tailings. It's based on the principles of uh, Chris's book in terms of thickness ratios, cutting edges, etc. And it's been uh, a really great help in order to sample uh, undisturbed uh, cylindrical samples of tailings material. Uh, you get commercial versions of the same thing that you can buy off the shelf. And actually, there's a German standard according to which uh, many of these are, are manufactured and, 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 and used. And then lastly, um, we can even do undisturbed samples in borals. And I think it's high time in South Africa that we upgrade our old Shelby tubes to some of these more sophisticated methods where, um, where it warrants or justifies uh, doing that. The Sherbrooke sampler or the chicken cage sampler, as it's known, is a, a framed cutting tool. So it's almost like a core barrel. Um, which at the bottom end has a as, as cutting tool. So it's rotated in the borel under slurry, and it will cut a cylindrical sample at the base of the borel. The neat part of it then is that, and you can't clearly see it, but in the picture on the left hand side, you can make out two of, well, you can actually see all three of the blades at the bottom. Now, those are spring loaded, but they on catches when you are coring out the sample. And as soon as you reach the, the final depth, you release those catches either by pulling a wire or counter rotating and the spring loaded blades will then slowly cut into the middle of the sample and actually form a pedestal on which the, the sample then sits and the whole thing is yanked out of the borel and you can recover samples of sensitive clays like the ones shown in the picture here which then follows the same procedure of wrapping with uh, cling film and tin foil until you're ready to ship the whole thing off to the laboratory so this is the rolls royce of borel undisturbed sampling uh, other than that, there are various forms of very fancy piston samplers. The, the Laval sampler developed in France isn't a good example. 
And uh, if you have time, you can read it, the paper or look at the slide here, but it uses gels and drilling muds and multiple pistons. And it's got three um, sleeves and barrels and, you know, the whole works in order to allow you to similarly extract an undisturbed core sample from a borer that does not suffer from the same disturbance effects that uh, that you will get when driving a Shelby tube into the soil. So that concludes um, this lecture, and I would like to leave you with uh, this thought. Um, I always believe that you must never, ever be too old to learn something new. And uh, I think Tazaki put it the best when he, you know, this was a court case where he was um, acting as an expert witness, and the opposing lawyer quoted the, from Tazaki's own book, uh, Theoretical Soil Mechanics, and said to Tazaki, uh, if that is not what he had written, and Tazaki said to him, yes, then replied the lawyer triumph triumphantly, the testimony you just gave contradicts what you wrote, does it not, Mr. D or Dr. Tazaki? Those in the audience who knew Tazaki uh, in the courtroom were hushed into disbelief. But then Tazaki replied, sir, you think I'm a vegetable that I have not learned anything new since then? So I'll leave you with that thought and with the uh, challenge to make every day an opportunity to learn something new. All right, I'm just going to take a sip of water. I'll see, uh, just uh, Brett, you're also welcome to join in. Uh, let's see if we can deal with one or two questions. I know I've taken up all the time, but I'm happy to stay on for another f uh, f uh, five or so minutes to deal with some questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Nico. I think uh, this was again another very, very interesting lecture. So, uh, from myself and behalf, and on behalf of the GeoDiv, uh, really thank you very much for for the lecture. Thank you for your time and for putting this uh, together. Um, I think we've we've about we on our ninety minute uh, limit. So I think uh, let's let's maybe look at two or three questions um, from your side, Nico. You're going to have to scroll down all the way to the bottom. Um, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Last time I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I, this is interesting. Uh, uh, I, I see more comments than questions, but here's a question. Um, are you aware of any contractors that have access to the Sherbrooke uh, borer sample? And the answer is no. But I'm happy to say that I'm seeing uh, of late more access to more advanced and more sophisticated um, drilling, testing, uh, in-situ testing and laboratory testing methods. Um, um, a a well-known contractor in, in, in our country is now collaborating with um, in-situ testing in the UK and is, is bringing to our country the knowledge and experience of these guys. Uh, and I've had the privilege of spending time with, with the manager of that company. And we now have access to things that normally we wouldn't have. Uh, for example, um, in situ vein shear testing equipment that is instrumented so that your measurements are taken down hole at the vein shear and then transmitted to the surface for electronic logging. Um, but the answer, no, I'm not aware of, of, of any of these, uh, in fact, I think the best you can do in South Africa now off the shelf, if that's the right word, is a Shelby tube. And that Shelby tube was probably manufactured in um, in the contractor's own, um, what do you call them? The word slips in a, a workshop, you know, just, uh, you know, probably maybe not even to the, to, to the design standard of a Shelby tube. Regardless of that, there's no reason why we should not start to inquire and insist on doing proper piston sampling. For example, in tailings, if you want to get a, a reasonably undisturbed sample of soft tailings, the Shelby tube is not going to work for you. We then have to start looking at uh, proper piston samplers or even something uh, more than that. I, I'm not suggesting that we go to ground freezing, but it, at least we start to take, we need to take the next step in advancing from Shelby to piston to more advanced piston and probably eventually to ground freezing and, and coring, where it is warranted to, to go to those extents. Um, someone is mentioning here uh, sonic drilling. It is it is a technology that I like a lot and I am using it quite often. 
the benefit of, of it's ob, it obviously does have advantages and disadvantages and it, and it forms part of the next topic. But just quickly, the, the advantage of, of, of sonic drilling is that you get a representative sample top to bottom, no matter what you are drilling. Uh, the technology will drill through the loosest tailings to reinforce concrete. All right, it, uh, it, it, it will go through all of those materials. And although it does not recover a fully undisturbed sample, it will recover a representative sample for you to have sight of and to be able to do tests like grading tests. So, so in, you know, rotary core drilling in loose sand, you don't get anything. You will get a really good sample in rod rock, but in loose friable material, it all washes away. So the advantage of sonic drilling there is recovery of sample from top to bottom. Uh, question there is, how do you sample loose sands for collapse potential test? I'm referring to aeolian cal calorie deposits, which are mostly fine. Um, certainly, I would look at, you know, something similar to the, um, the tailing sampler that, uh, that I, that I uh, showed a few slides of. You get these DIN type tube, tubes that you buy, can buy off the shelf and with that um, uh, base plate and drive hammer, of, you know, you can, you can carefully drive the tube into the, those Kalari sands uh, and, and then dig out the whole thing, wrap it up and send it off to the lab. That would be my, my best take on uh, sampling undisturbed, uh, sorry, sampling collapsible sands for collapse potential tests. Um, Nico, so mm -hmm. again, it's, uh, it appears as though not many questions are, are coming through. Again, a sign of a, a very good lecture. Um, so yeah, I, I think if you can find maybe one more question you, you want to answer. Um, otherwise, I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't even see many questions here. So. Yeah, maybe this is a good question um, as a final question. Uh, the question states, have you heard of the UK Associate of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Specialists position on trial pitting? That is no man entry. What in your opinion is the necess necessity for entering the, the pit given the high risk or perhaps what is the justification? That is a really difficult question. And I, I think that our industry may evolve to the point where we will not be allowed to enter test pits for profiling and, and sampling purposes. In fact, um, some of our clients already prevent us from doing this. Um, some of the big clients in this country, the standard safety procedures will not allow you to enter a test pit um, for, for profiling purposes. And, and that might be the way that the whole industry will move in, in the future. Personally, I think that a test pit is probably the best bang for buck in terms of site investigation, provided that you do it in a safe manner. In other words, that you adhere to all the protocols and procedures to ensure your own and the person that works with you safety when uh, doing test pitting. And, and, it, and it's going to, it relies very heavily on experienced engineers to transfer their skills and knowledge to the, to the younger engineers, uh, to make them aware of the risks, to teach them the dangers uh, and to lead, lead by example. And I always say that no, no test bit or the information that you can get from a test bit is worth your life or health. If it looks unsafe, you stay out of that thing. Only enter into a test bit that you are confident is stable and safe to enter, especially the deeper test pits. Um, so it, I, I can't answer the question. I, personally, I have no problem with test pitting, um, provided it's done in a responsible, safe manner. But I'm also fearful, maybe fearful is not the right word, I'm expectant that in the future we will find less opportunities to actually do that. And what that means is that we will have to find alternative in situ test methods that will substitute for that first hand, you know, hands on profiling of, of a test bit. And, and we may end up having to rely on, on drilling methods to uh, extract our samples and allow us to, to do the profiling on, on core specimens.
but I, it, it, it certainly in one way it's a step backwards it might be a step forwards in terms of of the safety of of, of, of our engineers and geologists okay nico um i think that's all the time we we have for today so again um from myself on behalf of geodiv on behalf of all the attendees Thank you very, very much for your time today. That was a very interesting lecture. Um, yeah, that, thank you very much. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. OK, um, for all the attendees, uh, just a, a final note. Um, Dr. Nico, Nico's lecture will be downloaded this evening. Um, we will have it available on the GeoDiv website in the next coming days, probably in a, about a week or so. It will also be uploaded to YouTube. So the links that I've posted uh, in the announcement section, you can follow those links. The links were also available on the web link that I had sent out earlier. In any case, I'll probably send out another email next week just with a, a follow up with the links that you can um, access the videos. Um, again, as mentioned previously, the next lecture will be around mid September. That will be presented by Dr. Lakshmi from UCT. The dates, times and topics will still be confirmed, so please look out for that invite. It'll probably come out in uh, in the next four weeks. All right, so that's it. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I hope you all have a great evening further. Uh, keep safe and bye for now.